I was born in Tyrone on an island. My family was wealthy and held an important position. I had an older sister, and we were the only children in our family. There was a significant age gap between us, as she was six years older than me. Because of this, we didn't spend much time playing together when I was young. When I was only 12 years old, my sister got married. I have a memory of my sister's wedding day. On that day, many people came to celebrate, and they were all laughing, singing, and filled with happiness. However, I felt a sense of sadness when my sister left with her new husband, Mr. Karu. She had always been very kind to me, even kinder than my own mother. I couldn't help but cry when she went off to her new home in Dublin. It seemed like my mother and father didn't have much love for me. My parents were more interested in having sons and didn't show much interest in me. About a year after my sister's wedding, we received a letter from Mr. Karu. He informed us that my sister was unwell and wanted to come back home to Tyrone to be with her family. I felt sad about her illness, but I was also happy that she would be visiting us. My father told me that they were leaving Dublin on Sunday and would arrive here on Tuesday evening. Tuesday finally arrived, but it felt like an incredibly long day. I anxiously waited hour after hour, hoping to hear my sister and her husband's arrival. As time passed, the sky grew dark, and soon it was midnight. Despite the late hour, I couldn't fall asleep. I listened attentively and waited anxiously. Suddenly, at around one o'clock in the morning, I heard a distant noise. Without wasting a moment, I rushed out of my bedroom and headed to the living room. Excitedly, I called out to my father, they're here, they're here. We swiftly opened the front door to get a better view. We stood there, waiting for a few minutes, and then we heard the noise again, a sound of someone crying in the distance on that dark night. However, we couldn't see anything. There were no lights, no signs of people. We stepped outside, eager to greet my sister and help her with her bags, but to our surprise, nobody was there. No one came. I gazed at my father, and he looked back at me, equally puzzled. We both couldn't comprehend what had happened. I heard a noise, I said. Yes, I heard it too, father, I replied. But where are they? We returned to the house without saying another word. A sudden sense of fear enveloped us. The following day, a man arrived and delivered the news that my sister had passed away. She had fallen very ill on Sunday, worsened on Monday, and sadly, at around one o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, she had passed away. It was the exact time we had been outside, waiting for her. I could never forget that night. For the next two years, I was filled with immense sadness. It felt as if I had stopped living. I didn't want to engage in any activities or speak to anyone. Mr. Carew, my sister's husband, soon remarried another woman in Dublin. I felt a sense of anger that he had seemingly forgotten my sister so quickly. Now. I was the only child of a wealthy and influential family. As I approached the age of 14, men began visiting our home. They came with the intention of meeting me, perhaps to seek my hand in marriage. However, I didn't like any of those men and believed that I was still too young to be married. When I turned 16, my mother took me to Dublin, a bustling city. She claimed that we would meet wealthier and more interesting men there compared to those in Tyrone. She assured me that finding a suitable husband in Dublin would be easy. In Dublin, my happiness began to blossom. 
I met many friendly people and enjoyed dancing every evening. Numerous young men approached me, engaging in conversations and requesting dances. I found pleasure in talking to them. I started to truly live and laugh again, no longer consumed by constant thoughts of my deceased sister. However, my mother wasn't as content. She wanted me to find a husband swiftly. One night, before going to bed, she entered my room and asked, Do you know Lord Glenn Fallon? I replied, Oh yes, I do. He's that ugly old man from Kahajila, I remarked. He's not ugly, and he's not old, Fanny, my mother quickly responded. He comes from a very wealthy and influential family too. And he wants to marry you. He loves you. He loves me, wants to marry me, but he's mistaken, mother, I replied. I don't love him. I can't marry someone I don't love. Please, think about it. My mother responded calmly, Fanny, he's a good man, and he wants to marry you. You'll be a very fortunate young woman. With that, my mother left the room, and I sat there quietly for a long time. Lord Glenn Fallon, I thought, was a kind and amiable man. I didn't love him, no, but I did like him. He always engaged in conversations about intriguing subjects. I never felt happy at home with my parents, but whenever I talked to Lord Glenn Fallon, I felt better. The following morning, when I saw my mother, I uttered just one word, yes. Lord Glenn Fallon and I got married the following spring. Two days after our wedding, we bid farewell to my family and set off on our own. Three days later, we arrived in Kahajila, and I saw my husband's beautiful house for the first time. It was situated near a river, surrounded by abundant trees and blooming flowers in the garden. Birds sang melodiously in the trees, and the sky appeared a vibrant blue. Standing beside my husband, I took in the picturesque view and felt an overwhelming sense of happiness. Come, my love said, urging me to enter and meet Martha, who was in charge of cooking, cleaning, and managing the household. We stepped inside, and I encountered Martha, a friendly elderly woman with cheerful blue eyes. She gave me a tour of the house, and suddenly, I felt an exciting energy being in that place. It was a joyous abode, women sang in the kitchen, men tended to fires in the living rooms, and there were dogs and cats scattered about. Come with me now, madam, said Martha. Let's take a look at your bedroom. Then we can bring up your bags, and you can freshen up before dinner. I followed her, and soon we reached a large brown door. This is your room, she said as she opened the door. I stood there, feeling a sudden chill of fear. In front of me stood something large and black. I didn't know what it was. At first, I thought it might be an old coat, but there was no person inside it. Quickly, I jumped back, filled with fear and distanced myself from the door. My mother asked if something was wrong. I replied hastily, nothing. Perhaps it's nothing. But deep down, I believed I had seen a big black coat in there when the door opened. Martha's face turned pale with fear. I inquired about what was troubling her. She explained that whenever someone sees the black coat in the house, it signifies that something unfortunate is about to happen to the Glenn Fallon family. As a child, she saw the black coat, and the next morning, old Lord Glenn Fallon passed away. Something bad is going to happen now, madam. I know it, she warned. We proceeded downstairs to have dinner. I felt unhappy and afraid, 
but I didn't mention anything to my husband about the black coat. I wanted to forget about it and regain my happiness. The following day, Lord Glen Fallon and I took a walk together to explore the house and gardens, as I desired to become better acquainted with my new home. I like this house and all the people here, I said. I'm happy to be here with you. It's much better than Tyrone. My husband remained silent for a long time, walking with his head down, lost in thought. Then, suddenly, he turned to me, took my hand, and spoke earnestly, Fanny, listen to me carefully. There's something I must ask of you. Please only stay in the rooms located at the front of the house. Never venture into the rooms at the back or the small garden near the back door. Never. Do you understand, Fanny? His face was pale and filled with sorrow. I comprehended his words, but I couldn't grasp why he had become a different person since we arrived in Kahajila. He no longer smiled or laughed. I pondered whether the back of the house held some sort of danger, but he didn't want to discuss it further. We returned to the house without exchanging any more words, and I tried my best to forget his instructions and regain the happiness I had felt before. It was approximately a month later when I encountered the other woman for the first time. One day, I decided to take a walk in the gardens. It was a beautiful day, so after lunch, I hurriedly went up to my room to fetch my hat and coat. However, upon opening the door, I found a woman sitting near the fire. She appeared to be around 40 years old, dressed in a black coat. Her face was pale, and upon closer observation, I noticed that her eyes were also white, she was blind. Madam, I said, this is my room. There must be a mistake. Your room is elsewhere. She replied firmly, no, I don't think so. There's no mistake. I inquired about the whereabouts of Lord Glen Fallon, to which she responded that he was downstairs in the living room. Confused, I questioned who she was and why she was in my room. Her only request was for me to relay to Lord Glen Fallon that she wanted to see him. I insisted, I must tell you that I am Lady Glen Fallon, and I want you to leave my room immediately. However, she adamantly denied my claim, striking my face with force. In pain and distress, I cried out for help, and soon Lord Glen Fallon arrived. I hurriedly exited the room as he rushed in, waiting anxiously outside the door to eavesdrop on their conversation. I couldn't catch every word spoken, but it was evident that Lord Glen Fallon was furious, while the blind woman seemed deeply unhappy. When he finally emerged, I approached him and asked, who is that woman? Why is she in my bedroom? I asked, but my husband remained silent. Once again, his face turned pale with fear. His only words to me were, forget her. However, I couldn't forget her. Each day, it became increasingly challenging to communicate with my husband. He was always quiet perpetually filled with sadness and fear. He would sit for hours, gazing into the fire with sorrowful eyes. But I didn't understand why. He refused to confide in me. One morning, after breakfast, Lord Glen Fallon suddenly spoke up, stating, I have the answer. We must leave and go to another country, France or Spain, perhaps. What do you think, Fanny? Without waiting for my response, he swiftly left the room. I sat there, deep in thought for a long time. Why must we leave Kahajila? I couldn't comprehend. Moreover, I didn't wish to be too far away from my aging parents in Tyrone. 
Though they didn't express much love toward me, I still desired to be near them. I pondered over it all day, unsure of what to say to my husband when he returned in the evening for dinner. I remained silent. After dinner, feeling weary, I retired to my bedroom early. I longed for a restful night's sleep, hoping it would bring clarity to my thoughts. The following day arrived, and once again, I closed my eyes and attempted to sleep. However, slumber eluded me as I found myself dreaming of the black coat. Suddenly, I woke up to darkness and silence. Someone stood at the end of my bed, holding a light in one hand. It was the blind woman. In her other hand, she held a knife. I tried to escape, to get out of bed and run towards the door, but she stopped me. If you want to live, don't move, she warned. Then she posed a question, did Lord Glen Fallon marry you? I replied, yes, he did. He married me in front of a hundred people. She expressed sadness and declared, that's unfortunate because I don't think he told you that he already had a wife, me. I am his wife, not you, young woman. You must leave this house tomorrow. With that, she left the room without making a sound. That night, sleep eluded me once again. When morning arrived, I revealed everything to my husband. Who is the blind woman? I asked him. She claimed last night that she is your wife and I am not. Did you go into the rooms at the back of the house? My husband asked angrily. I told you never to go there. I replied, no, I didn't. I was in my bed all night. My husband approached me, pleading, please, tell me what is happening. His face turned pale again, and he remained silent for a long time. Finally, he uttered, no, she is not my wife. You are. Don't listen to her. She doesn't know what she is saying. Then, he abruptly left the room. I hurriedly sought out Martha. I no longer liked this house. My husband was a perplexing man, and I couldn't comprehend him. I yearned to understand the identity of the blind woman, the one in the black coat. I wanted to know everything. Martha found me in distress and consoled me, saying, Don't cry, madam. Sit down and listen to me. What I'm about to tell you is not pleasant. She continued, the blind woman, the one in the black coat, is deceased. You saw her ghost. She was married to your husband, and she was Lady Glen Fallon. Nobody knows how she died. Her bedroom was at the back of the house. Someone witnessed your husband holding a knife on the night she died. Did he kill her? Nobody knows. When we discovered her, the knife was on the floor next to her, and her eyes. Somebody had gouged them out after her death. Perhaps he didn't want her to see his other women, his next wife, you. I couldn't bear to speak to my husband again. That day, I left. I was too frightened to stay another minute in Kahajila. I knew the blind woman would return and attempt to harm me. I bid farewell to Martha, took my bags, and instructed my driver to take me back to Tyrone. I am content living here with my mother and father now. The house is peaceful, and I sleep well each night. They treat me with more kindness than before. Sometimes, my deceased sister visits me in my dreams at night, but I am never afraid. Martha informs me that the blind woman is attempting to locate me at Kahajila and intends to harm me. She harbors jealousy towards me, but she could never find me there. 
She must await the arrival of the next Lady Glen Fallon.